They don't need much of an introduction to Nico Jesutis because they learned about the C++ standard library through Nico's book of the same name, and uh, which I went on Amazon and uh, uh, they classify him as a best-selling author. And, uh, and, and <laughs> It, it, that also enlightened me to, Nico has written other books too, uh, they, they may perhaps have not been uh, the, the sort of blockbusters, but uh, he's, he's a, that's one of the ways he makes his living, is writing books about C++. He has been a member of the C++ committee for many, many years, since the late 1990s, and um, that the authors are important members, there aren't very many of them, but they're important members and contributors to C++ because they're the ones that try to have to figure out how to explain this stuff. And so they're often the early warning of we've got a problem with the standard library or the language. And I think uh, <laughs> some of that you're going to probably hear about at this yes. talk. The other thing I want to <laughs> point out is that um, Nico has a tied ties to Boost. Way, I mean, when Boost was six or seven people still at that level talking about it, Nico was one of those people. And as to sort of get ready for this talk, uh, he unearthed a <coughs> fragment of an email exchange between he and I. I have it on a slide later. It's dated <laughs> July 1998, where we're trying to decide whether, because Boost had just been going, I think, since May, and we're trying to decide if he dares put the URL or references to Boost in his book, which is just about to ship pretty soon. And we're trying to decide, is, is there any likelihood Boost is going to last long enough to, you know, for his book to get out yes. there on the shore step? <laughs> and, and we decided, I think in the end, we decided it was, you know, there was running that risk. But it was your decision, not the, mine. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason Boost thrived is it caught fire with people, users primarily. But, but uh, so the early people it caught fire with were incredibly important because they're the ones that let those of us that were doing active in this know that the community cared about Boost and that Boost was important to the community. And that was, that motivation was incredibly important in the, in the early years. So anyway, Here's Nico Jasudis. Let's give him a big hand. And <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Beam, and you st have stolen the first slide half of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe I replace it by another story. My first meeting in, uh, with uh, C++ standardization was in uh, 1997 in London. When I entered the lobby, I didn't know anybody. But I, I saw there's a crowd of people and they were chatting around and suddenly there came somebody out of the elevator. Um, um, it was Beeman afterwards. And a little bit later there, walked, there came a nice woman, woman out of this elevator. And she came, came there, looked at the group, went to Beeman, gave him a big, big kiss and said to him, now you have to tell me your name. <laughs> <laughs> that was Beeman's wife, I found out. <laughs> so this, is, this was my beginning of uh, the first standardization meeting, and it was really exciting for me. I'm, I'm, I'm not a native English-speaking guy, as you probably have heard already. So a lot of things were, were new and exciting. And to tell you, uh, to tell you some truth, um, I was about to think about writing a book about the standard library, but there was already a book out, which I wrote in German. So before I wrote um, the English book, I wrote this book in Germany, 
um, discussing the C++ standard library um, before the first standards was uh, published. And as I said, I came to this meeting and I said, so now they, people have to understand that I'm helpful. So they had, um, as I told the day before yesterday in the evening session, we, we didn't have laptops, we worked with papers. So there was one task asking, well, here we have a bunch of paper and, and we missed the page numbers. So I said, yeah, I can add page numbers. I thought this is not a critical issue for a German guy. <laughs> it turned out I was wrong. <laughs> because what we learn in school is not that you spell uh, English uh, digits different than in German. So guess this was a paper, this was not the original. I added my understanding of what is a one or an 11. Uh, you might see that, well, most Americans might think, oh, this is a seven or 77. And it turned out that during the meeting, when uh, it, it happened once that somebody said, oh, uh, please look at page 11. And they said, oh, this is crapped. This page numbers are crapped. So that was my <laughs> first lesson. <laughs> so so that's, that's, for example, 17 in Germany. And ah, by the way, that might be the moment if you just see this on the desk, uh, where Bjarne Stusup came around and saw my book with some bunch of paper above it, and he, he only read Die C++. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time at the first meeting, I can promise you. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the beginning, and as um, um, Beeman already said, Oh, no, um, or oh, as I always said, English is not my native language. Another thing I have to say is I'm not a C++ expert or core expert. You are probably a lot better than me. I can be very slow, um, but I'm pedantic. That's good for writing books. I really have to understand things, and then I can present them. And the consequence is here you will not learn anything <laughs> from this talk because I want to learn something from you in this talk. So I will raise a couple of questions instead of answering them. Okay, so Beeman already told the story of this slide. Um, by the way, that, that was the first two places where, we, where I mentioned boost inside this book. One was about shared pointers and the other was about compose function objects. These are the only places where I asked him for permission to discuss it. Okay, so you all know the role of boost we have now. And however, maybe it's not clear how essentially good it is and I think how it contributes to the success of C++ 11, 14, and 17. Um, this is a current picture without the boost um, here, how we work in the standardization groups. And as you can see, we have um, 13 uh, working groups, which discuss new features and new libraries. And then we have um, the evolution, the new stuff for core and the new stuff for the library. Then we have the guys that uh, just do maintenance for the existing stuff in core and for the existing stuff in the library. And then we have the full committee. And whenever we decide on something, um, ideally if it's a library, ideally we have an implementation in Boost. Then this went to a working group, say the file system working group. So we start to standardize it. Um, then uh, we, in the, in the general panel of the library evolution group and in library, we, th we look at it, we approve it, and finally we vote on it. And this is working very, very well for new libraries. The reason is that most of these libraries um, exist already in Boost. So that process works very well. However, we also have new language features in, in, in C++. And there we take the other path. And there we have a problem because 
it's not easy to implement a new language feature to get some experience and to understand whether we design it well or not. So there might be some implementations in compilers and usually we ask for it. So is there some implementation experience for no except in some library? And, um, but that comes very late. And the, the really bad thing is when core people decide on something new, this usually has an impact on the library. And that means we have to adapt. Um, that's a problem. So somehow we need a, to exchange things. And as you probably would expect, uh, we have last minute changes. And these last minute changes might impact libraries, existing libraries. And that can cause a lot of trouble. So the day before yesterday, in the evening session, when you grilled the committee, the question was, are we happy with the process? I'm not sure. We have a problem here. And I give you some examples where this occurred. So this is a timeline for C++. Uh, let's look what happened in, with C++ 11. So the goal was to have it out as C++ 11. So we, uh, the, the, the meeting schedule was scheduled in, a, scheduled in a way that we would have to, to have the final content ready in March 2011. In 2009, we had a problem. We found a problem. The problem, you probably all know, is that we found out that the new concept of move semantics breaks the strong guarantees of vector pushback. That was raised two years before the final vote. I mean, you might say two years is a long period. Uh, we meet two, twice or three times a year. And most of us do the work for changes <coughs> not as a major job, just when they have time to do so, maybe as part of their job or maybe as part of their free time. So that means we have, some, we have a, found a significant problem and we have three or four more meetings time to fix this problem. So as, uh, first we had to discuss this problem in detail and to find out how should we deal with it in general, especially in the language. So as a result, one year later, we voted on adding the new keyword no except as a consequence of uh, dealing better with move semantics and exception guarantees. That means we have one year left to deal with no except in the library, in the existing library. And by the way, this was just the, the approval to have the new keyword. The, Next meeting in August, there was still on the agenda final clarifications on no except. That means we more or less have one, at least, at most two meetings left to understand what this means for the library and then make the appropriate changes. My battery is slow. So we had a problem. Uh, we started in a big chaos to add no except here and there, and that could be fine. We had a couple of proposals. We did the best we could. And we, found, we came to a moment where we said, that doesn't work that way. We need at least to have some idea, some guidelines, how to deal with no except in the library. So how to apply this new language feature. There's, Ella, there's one of those guys who, uh, who, who um, made, made the go and, and rescued C++11, John. Thank you very much. Because John and Alistair, they worked on it and they started to provide a policy or a guideline how to apply no except. They first wrote a paper, we need that policy, and then they wrote a paper, this is the policy. And the policy um, was um, raised in the March meeting in 2011. 
That's a meeting where we vote on the standard, just to find that out. Yes? So in that meeting, we had the guideline, and then we apply the guideline, and then we vote on the standard, and then that's it. That's a cool new C++11 standard. So I think for that, it's not too bad what we have in C++11. It could be a lot worse. So here's, here are the guidelines, um, more or less um, literally taken. Each library function having a white contract, which means, which does not specify undefined behavior due to a precondition. Um, and when the library working group agrees that it cannot throw, should be marked as con unconditionally no accept. If a swap and move or move assignment uh, operator can be proven not to throw by applying the no accept operator, then it should be marked as conditionally no accept. No other function should be use a conditional no accept specification. And this was because we knew that it's, it's very, very important for the strong exception guarantees and for the performance of pushback to, uh, to, have, um, th to do the best we can to say when uh, move operations do not throw. We can skip the other stuff. Um, yesterday I promised to answer the question, why don't we have a guideline saying no move operation should throw? So why don't we specify, it, can it be that we have any useful beast in the standard where it's, it is, it, it's, not, it's okay to throw an exception under some circumstances in move? And the answer is, as always, allocators. If we implement move for a vector or for a string, and we change the allocators, this is not possible. So we have to throw in that situation. Sean gave yesterday a talk that the whole approach for allocators may be, might be broken, and this is maybe a one consequence of it. So, that was the design policy, and we followed this policy mostly. A very typical example is basic string. Basic string, move constructor, and move assignment now are marked as no except. Great. Well, you might have seen that we have a library issue. The library issue 2319 is a proposal for C17 to remove this no except requirements for the move constructor. Uh, we voted on that in Seattle. It was pretty close whether we adopt that or not and whether we adopt that for C14 or not. Um, I have uh, the reason to, re to be able to remove no except was that one compiler wanted to be standard conforming, although they, uh, they might throw in move operations. Uh, just to, to as, a, as, a, as a debug feature. So only in debug mode, not in release mode. But in debug mode, they want it still to be standard conforming, and it's not allowed to be standard conforming by skipping the no except there. We had a vote on that, and the decision was, okay, let's go into this direction. I was strongly opposed that. I have that's for the records. And... Um, it's now, this issue is ready for C++17. And I said, well, let's move it to 70 because what I really don't want to have is that here we have no no except. That here, there's nothing. It's okay to have something saying here should be a no except and under some circumstances, this no except can be skipped. Um, and I started to make a proposal or to do, do a request on the library reflector to make a proposal how we mark something as this should be no except, but it does not have to be no except. 
So that raised a long discussion. And uh, as a result, a couple of things happened. First of all, it turned out that vector move operations have not no accept specification. We don't have them in the standard. That means that if a vector contains vectors, we have a problem. <laughs> or we have bad performance. Um, Howard Hinnard wrote a little test program. Look at this test program. We have an object, and here we have, with a macro expansion, a no accept, so we can turn it off or turn it into a, a lowercase no accept. And here on the right side, you see, let's create a vector of, what is this, one million elements of this piece, of this class with strings inside. Um, and let's then add one element. And um, measure the time. It's not exactly that, I, I slightly modified it, but the essence is exactly this program. So that was the result. It turned out with, C, with Clang, C++, with um, O3 optimization, the uh, no except version was 10 times faster than without the no except. It's not 10%, it's 10 times faster. Or to give you some more numbers, without no except, um, um, on, on the Clang compiler, we had something like 230 milliseconds, uh, and with no except, we had 20 milliseconds. I run the, I run the same test again today, this morning, uh, with G49 on a different machine. It's not a proof that C++ uh, G++ is 10 times faster than Clang. <laughs> so um, I had these measurements. I, I couldn't get any useful number for the no except version. Um, but when I raised um, to 10 million objects, I again got something like this factor of 10. And um, then I tried 100 million objects and I got a code up. <laughs> okay. And it's, by the way, I, I, I put a try-catch block here. It was not a standard exception. There's something broken inside then. Okay. So these are huge, huge numbers. And that, that changed a lot in the discussion of the library team. And now we agree all, I think, that we will change this recommendation to remove no except from string move operations and we will add no except to vector move operations for C++ uh, uh, 17. Which however raises the question, how do we deal with the other containers? So how do we deal with stack, list, associative containers, and other containers? We don't agree on that now, according to the discussions we have. So it might be that we still want to have something like can we specify uh, can we specify in the standard something like this should be no except but you are not required to, <laughs> and uh, then still we have the issue how do we formulate that in the standard? It's a formulation question for the standard, not for 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 source code. Um, so I asked for some proposals. How could we do that? Um, we can maybe write the no except specification in italics, which is bad because then, then it's a, a font issue. We can just uncomment it in the standard or make no except attribute. Some form was discussed of no except uh, um, depending on the N debug, which also has its problem. I come to that in a moment. Um, no, except probably. <laughs> <laughs> Throw unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gabi is not here, huh? so I can tell you the last proposal came by Gabi. 
treffen uns. <lacht> okay, was there a question? Or? Currently, compilers have flags that turn off standard features and therefore make them non-conforming. Why can't those compilers do effectively the same thing? Yeah. The question is, we already have features that make um, compilers not, not non-standard conforming. So why don't you deal with that? This was discussed in the reflector. <laughs> and we have strong opinions in both directions. So one, one opinion was that uh, in, the, in the compilers, um, a lot of people use debug mode and, and as a default mode at least in during development, but even sometimes in, in, in when the system runs. So in that, this case, it's important for them to be still standard conforming. But that's a valid argument. So some of us there raised the issue in the committee that um, certain compiler vendors debug modes were already non-conforming. So what the heck was the issue here? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't repeat it for the record. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so because I have more, d d not enough time. So it's not over yet. So one thing in the discussions about that, one thing that was proposed was, should we add the no accept guidelines as follows? If the move constructor has a no accept specification, then the default constructor should have no accept specification because they are more or less twins. Um, it, it's, it's more or less they, they, they jump into the same state according to how move uh, semantics is currently defined in the standard. Um, yes, this was also discussed a little bit, um, but for example, one counter argument was I cannot find anywhere in the allocation requirement that if the allocator is default constructible, that it is no throw default constructible. So again, the allocator raises some interesting questions. So we might come up with, come up with something saying, so the default constructor of vector is no except if the default constructor of the allocator type does not throw. That's something we, we have to discuss. Uh, and we have to discuss whether this uh, results into a new guideline or policy. And uh, we had other opinions here. One is, in, in my opinion, the whole currently current guideline is broken or wrong. Um, because, for example, it's, it sets up a conflict when I say, specify something like operator star. We now need to make a choice between adding a requires clause and a no except. Uh, this does not improve the quality of the specification. I, I don't discuss it yet now with you. Just to make you clear, we are under discussion about how to develop the no except guidelines for the next standard round. So what do we learn from that? First of all, what we learn is Oh, Gabi, it's good that you came now and not five minutes ago. <laughs> Ask me afterwards why I said that now. <laughs> it's key to have guidelines for how to use C++ core features. Ideally, we need them together with the new features and not later. <laughs> but, Guidelines require experience and are living documents. So that's, that's a problem. So let's look in some other areas where I think guidelines could help. Initializer list and explicit. Initializer list and new feature in C11. So my question is, what does this program print? Think 20 seconds about it. Oh, oh, no, what does it print, not what does it print? Where are the statements in error or where are they valid? Okay, the first two guys is clear. 
This is not a default constructor, this is a function <laughs> declaration. Um, without any arguments or a call, we, we require an argument. Here we have um, the 47. It's an integer, no explicit for the uh, co uh, constructor taking an integer, so this is valid, fine. So what, how about the others? We have, we pass an initializer with with zero, one, two, and three arguments. That's it. The initializer list <coughs> is uh, explicit, so there is no explicit, no implicit conversion from an initializer list uh, to P, what is required, and foo. However, the overloading rules say if I have multiple matching constructors, the first thing I try out is a default constructor, then I try out the initializer list constructors, and then I try out all the uh, other constructors. So therefore, without any argument, it's okay. And that, by the way, it has also an effect on declarations. If you declare objects using initializer list syntax or the, the new uniform initialization syntax, it's uh, import the explicit plays a role if we use copy initialization. So if we put an uh, assignment operator here or assignment character here. Yes, this is okay. <laughs> this will fail to compile. Which is a little bit, well, I would say at least unfortunate. <laughs> yes. Let's do it the other way around. Let's put the ex explicit in the, in the ordinary constructor and remove the explicit from initializer list. And we have the same arguments here. So um, now if I declare something without the equal sign, it's, it always works because the explicit doesn't play a, play a role, but for, with, for copy initialization, it plays a role. So it's an error to assign the empty initializer list. It's not an error to assign um, multiple arguments in the uh, initialization list. That's also unfortunate, probably. And it's even more unfortunate than you thought because we have that bad design in the standard. We have here class vector, we have the default constructor being explicit defined and the initializer list constructor not being explicit. And that has the interesting effect which uh, Marshall and Jonathan told me um, if you write a template, a variadic template, and you pass the arguments for, for initializing the vector with the equal sign, it will compile for um, one, two, three arguments, but it will not compile for zero arguments. Is there something? Yeah, um, so If I have two sets of braces, would that error go away? I don't think so. But ah, the answer is no. Thank you. Yeah, I know that. that yeah, enough. <laughs> Good. By the way, I'm thinking about proposing that explicit doesn't play a role in copy initialization. So that this is always valid. Not only in copy initialization, not in function call. Um, who would like to have that proposed? Who would not like to have that proposed? <laughs> I skipped that. Okay. Other thing to do. Okay. Yeah, so we have library issue 2193, where we fix that for C40. Last minute change, was it? Right. If the, the old one had to be explicit, because otherwise you could get, you could implicitly convert an allocator to a vector. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, exactly. So the, the reason it was explicit was because of the allocator, and we don't want it to have an co implicit conversion of an allocator to a vector, which could be a f nice feature to confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> so we so, so we split up this this functions in in two. And by the way, this is a problem we fix in all containers. But we have more. I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, look here, the, the vector taking two input iterators is not exp explicit. So there's an implicit conversion from two iterators to, to a vector. Is that a good thing or not? I'm not sure about that. Marshall? Um, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that it's a, it's a great thing, but it's far less dangerous than the single argument um, implicit conversions. So yeah, yeah. You think it's your argument is it's it's always more da uh, more dangerous if we have a single argument conversion because there we don't need the curly braces for initialization. Yeah. Good. Okay. So this is something we might also discuss. Do we need guidelines for how to deal with explicit? Well, I think we need guidelines for that. Uh, and you know, a different question is what should be written in these guidelines. Um, I'm pretty sure that one guideline should be the default constructor should never be explicit and the initializer list constructor should never be explicit. Um, and any other constructor should be explicit if the values um, don't fill directly the the value of the object. So um, the past arguments don't fill directly the value of the object. So if the parameters if affect behavior instead of core content, then, then it, there's something we have to discuss. And then we can discuss, should this rule apply only to one argument or to multiple argument uh, places? Yeah. And uh, by the way, as a side discussion, we might think about, shouldn't we always declare the distinction default constructor separated from all other constructors. That's also something we have to discuss. <coughs> that might raise a number of this, uh, constru uh, constructors. Tuple has already 18 constructors. So there might be some bad consequences. And by the way, it's an interesting question. Which of these constructors should be explicit? <laughs> and some, some nice counter examples of strange behavior caused because some are explicit and some are not. That's for C++ puzzle books. <laughs> okay. Next example. Do we need guidelines for const expr? <laughs> no? Well, we have them. We have them? We have at least one. One guideline is don't use them or what? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the guideline we have, Marshall? The guideline that we have is that, uh, that standard library implementations are required to put const expert exactly where it is in, is in the standard and nowhere else. And That's not a, well, he said we have a guideline saying that implementers should put const expert only where the standard requires that if and only if the standard mentions that. That's, by the way, a different rule than for no except. Absolutely. So we have different rules whether there's freedom for compiler vendors to add no except and to add const extra. For, yeah. So that's not a guideline. That, that's, I would say that's the question, is it standard conforming or not? So the guideline we need is, so where do we put the const extra in the standard, in the standard library? And there was recently a thread about that a discussion in the library working group or in the library reflector. Let's look at something that, that was discussed there. Um, some proposal was const expr is not for optimization. So a proposal for a guideline was const expr is not for optimization. The compiler may 
uh, can inline well already. Use constant when guaranteed static initializations is important. For example, the construction of global atomics really cannot be deferred to runtime. Use constant expo when you anticipate using the results to define array sizes or appear within template non-type arguments. That's a, but that was the first proposal how to deal with const expo. And then additional arguments flew around. Um, I think that making everything possible is borderline insane. It leads to unnecessary increased compile times, pot potential code bloat, and wishes to overload on const expo so that we can select different algorithms for compile time and runtime. Okay. By all means, be generous, but use const expression only when there is a potential need for guaranteed compile time evaluation. The response for that was, beneficial uses of const expression on non-trivial com non computations aren't always obvious from past experience. That says experience might not even help. <laughs> There seems to be a potential need for everything that can be const expr to be const expr. And that's exactly an, ex an impression I have. How do we gain confidence that nobody's going to need to use some function in a static initializer? <coughs> so this is raising the question, shouldn't we place const expr whenever we can and whenever it is allowed? I saw someone asking if main could be const expo. <laughs> in, the email, in the email here, there was, a, I don't know whether he was serious about that. <laughs> that did scare me a lot. <laughs> it will not be easy to draw a simple and clear line between const expo and non const expo in the library, but I think we have to try. Yeah, okay. We are supposed to be experts. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so we should be better at drawing a line than the average programmer. Context so can always be added later when there's empirical evidence showing benefit. The problem is when us experts get, get it wrong, everyone else waits years for us to release a fix, because we sh ship new releases every, I don't know, three years now. As per our vote, vendors are not allowed to offer a fixed version as a conforming extension. Yes, I don't think this is a question we can ignore, but for a solution to become a rule, someone has to propose something and gather a consensus. I'm looking for volunteers here. <laughs> Anybody here? Okay, because the problem is, if we don't do that, the mess will continue. And I think if you read all these sentences, it's a clear sign we have a clear mess here with cons expo. Maybe we have to wait until Scott Myers or Herb Sutter write a book about it. Another example. I start with a question. Which library function has changed with each and every C++ standard? So we have different versions in C++ 198, 03, 11, and 14. The constructors for standard vector? The constructors for that's multiple functions. Just one function. Push back? No, <laughs> probably not. Oh, well, the answer is make pair. <laughs> so we started in 98 with this approach. Make pair taking the arguments as we all learned as constant references to write unnecessary copies. We knew that. This is how it has to be. Well, 
There was a problem, though. Because make pair, if you did pass the string literal on ordinary C array, the same problem, we, the resulting pair was a pair of int and an array of three characters, according to language words. So, that caused interesting problems. For example, you couldn't compare the first element of a map with 42 and high and another string. I tried that out. I just changed the current G++ 4.9 version and hacked make pair to add const reference again. And I got an error message <laughs> with 238 rows for this line. Clang is probably a lot better, I know. <laughs> yeah, Th that was nasty. So we discussed that. Well, Andrew Koenig filed um, a defect in 1999. And yeah, we, we claim that we have a problem. And another problem is that this const character array is uncopyable. OK, so we discussed that. Here is a proposed resolution from our um, um, defect issue list. So um, the default, the proposed resolution was to change it to pass the elements by value. And here is the rationale for that. Two potential fixes were suggested by Matt Austin and Dietmar Kuhl. One is overlaying with array arguments. The other is use of a reference traits class with a specialization for arrays. I'm pretty surprised that we didn't do one of the things. And the Koenig suggested to changing to pass by value. It appeared that this was a much smaller change to the standard then the other two suggestions and any efficiency concerns were more than offset by the advantages of the solution. One of the few decisions we made in the standardization to make things slower but more convenient. Gabi. We make change based on the size of D, is that what you're saying? Pardon? Are the changes based on the size of the diff? Are the changes based on the size of the diff? Yeah. I don't understand the, the question. Uh, the size of the change to the standard. <coughs> ah, so you mean, ah, so you mean, so, so to keep this change small, you mean? I'm yeah, probably, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this was an argument because we could, we wanted to change this for 03 and we want to be as stable as possible. That was definitely an argument those times. So with L3, we changed make pair to um, be by value because, just to, to make sure why is this change effective, because by rule, template arguments pass by value DK. That means they convert the arrays into pointers. Um, for references, by rule, Template arguments do not decay. OK, so we solved the problem. Fine. Hmm, OK. Then we got C11. Well, we want to support move semantics. For move semantic support, we need references. Reference parameters, template parameters don't decay. So, we have the decay problem again. So we have now to make a real fix of the decay problem. And that's the result. 
That's a very, very simple function. <laughs> are you able to maintain make pair anymore? <laughs> well, you are probably. Even Marshall is able to. <laughs> yeah, so we have, um, we have um, type trait, SCD decay. Well, <coughs> colon, colon, type. Type name, of course, we cause type as a type. Uh, yeah, so it's obvious and clear and everything works fine. I should mention just for co completeness that we do more than before because the standard decay trait also strips const validity qualifiers, which the inbuilt library uh, language rules do not. Okay, so this was the version in C++11. And then we made the final nice fix in C++14, strictly speaking, not changing the semantics. Instead of writing type name SCDK T1 uh, type, we just have to write DKT, because DKT is a not new shortcut for DK uh, type. Why not? Go back to pass by value, but just move the arguments in the Why not go back to move by value? Um, well, because we need here this forward. I think there's no way for this forward to do it. Yeah? Those are sync arguments. Yes. So we pass them by value, move them into place. Okay. <coughs> so let's change it in C17. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that exactly raises my point, which was raised already yesterday by Tony, to uh, by Eric, to, uh, excuse me, um, to um, do we have guidelines or shouldn't we need guidelines how to declare template parameters now or parameters in general? but also template parameters. There was a question. Just to go back by not to pass by value, because we don't know whether T1 and T2 have constructors. That's one thing. Wait, you say, uh, one problem with by value is we don't know whether they have more constructors, mm -hmm. more move constructors. OK. Gabi? Um, it looks like it is not that we don't know how to make guidelines. We just don't know how to make guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the comment was, it looks like that we don't know how to make, what was the first thing? <coughs> it's not that. It, it, so th we only know, don't know how to make pairs. Yes. That's what you say. Okay. Uh, I don't think that changing it to take by value would work because we don't actually know that T1 and T2 are value types. They could be references already. So the argument is the past arguments could already be um, uh, references. So, if you so of course, move them, you just them without yeah. the value. So you still have a copy of them. Still have the decay in it. They were saying that they were going to move T1 and yeah, T2. But, but we're capped on that. They are relying on arguments of action. People will never take reference arguments to the table. If you want the reference, then you need to still tie it up to the same thing. So for the records, interesting discussion in the audience. <laughs> I, 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 I'm close to understand the details here. I mean, I, I got some arguments by Eric yesterday. I'm not the expert here. But <coughs> what I say is, I want to have a guideline. That's my point. By the way, there's an interesting trick because you always have to write twice now the return type, one here and one in the return statement. So a nice trick uh, used by GCC is that one. Introduce a third template argument with the default, uh, default initialize it by this return value and then use this third argument twice. <laughs> but if that's the C++14 version, make it all. If that's the C++ The C++ 14, 14 version, make it auto, remove the return type. Okay, make it auto, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's something we can do now. Yeah, so there are a couple of reasons now to change 
uh, make pair for C plus plus seventeen. Okay, it's, but actually this is not done in GCC because um, Jonathan, I, I, I asked Jonathan about it, and he only used this red trick internally uh, because he said if I do that, some clever clever programmers will find out that there's a third argument and will explicitly pass arguments to this first <laughs> to this third argument. Yeah, a sneaky little buggers are the programmers. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, just a side note for those who are still using VI or VIM, um, to be able to program that, there's an auto command to find out the matching closing um, angel bracket for templates. So, yes, the problem is we need guidelines for how to pass template parameters or in general, for how to pass parameters. Maybe something like, if you know that this slide I prepared before I heard Eric's talk, um, maybe some, or after discussing it in Seattle in a beer round, I should say, if you know that the object is always cheap to copy, then pass by value. If it might not be cheap to copy, you have to make a choice. If the expected type is likely to be an R value and is movable, then you call by value so that the caller passes temporaries or uses move. If it's not cheap to copy and not movable, then still take by value and let the caller use stdref. Otherwise, use const L value references and think about whether and where to decay. <laughs> Um, if you return something in the argument, use a non const L value reference. And if you have to pass move semantics into other parts of the called function, declare a universal reference and forward and think about whether and where to decay. I, this is probably not correct. I know that from what I heard here yesterday, for example. But this is a starting point for discussion. Eric, yesterday, thanks for allowing me to show this slide. He had other recommendations now, um, similar but slightly different. And uh, the most interesting different uh, recommendation was if there's something, an input-output argument independent from whether it's a template or not, or not, use a stateful algorithm object. I don't explain details now, you, if you haven't been in the, in the talk. So the whole point I have, if I want to, I need guidelines. The bad news is I might have the task to provide these guidelines. Well, not me, but my co-author, because as you probably know, I'm, I'm also one of the authors for C++ templates, and we are about to preparing a new edition, and probably in a new edition we have to answer this question. So. <laughs> We have to discuss it. But that might come too late for useful changes in the standard library. Can I just make a general observation? I think the fact that three years after the standard is, well, has been passed, we, has, we still don't know exactly how to do something as fundamental as passing values to <coughs> functions. I think that's great. Okay, there was, I understand it as a sarcastic comment <laughs> <laughs> that after, th after three years of having this standard out, we still don't know how to deal with it, that this is great. That's a fundamental thing. A fundamental, we, we have a fundamental, for a fundamental thing, passing arguments into a function, we no, don't know how to use it or apply it. How to do it? I think that maybe the real issue here is that we look at other languages and it looks similar, but that's just because they settle on a less performant solution. And so these changes that are going through are ways to improve performance that you can't get in other languages without even more complicated tricks. So the argument is that um, this might be a special problem in C because we have features that allow more, especially regarding performance, uh, so other, other languages don't have this problem. Yeah, I mean, both is probably true. So we have to work on that, that's the point. I don't see that anybody's working on that, by the way. That's a problem. 
So no, I, I'm not aware of anybody working on these guidelines. Tell me if I'm wrong. Is, is Scott Myers not generating the next creation, which I would expect would address it? Yeah, so maybe Scott Myers in his next book, as you said, is addressing this. Maybe Herb in a blog, I don't know. Eric in a talk. Yeah, but th th then we still then need consensus. And then if we have the consensus, then we can fix make pair again. <laughs> yeah. That comment is probably true, but your issue is that you want these guidelines for the library itself. Yes, I want earlier than the books from the program. Yes, my point is I want these guidelines when the core feature is voted on. So when we vote on move semantics and universal references and auto and decal type of auto, I want to have these guidelines. Which of course is only uh, raises a couple of problems. One is these features might not be implemented yet in a compiler to make some experience and some measurements. That's our big problem. That's a big problem. We can, we can change the standard in the library at the last minute based on some things we found in Boost and some experiences we made in Boost. And we have a lot of time to, to understand whether library features work or not if they use the existing core library features. But when we introduce a new core library features, we have a problem. And I don't know how to deal with that. I mean, we can, we can say any new core language feature is only valid one standard later. <laughs> so C17 is only for library features. What we discuss now as core features will become, in, when, when, after we have voted it uh, this year, it will be valid in C20. I don't think that's a good solution, but it's something to think about. Why not split the library <coughs> process from the language process? Why not split the library process from the language process? But we have it split already. I mean, we, that's a problem. Um, I, um, it, it's not a new problem. I, I have worked in, in a project where we said, so some people work on the framework and some people work on the application of the framework. And you usually build your release uh, for the framework guys earlier than the other. So, but... I, I, I mean more split the ISO approval process. The ISO approval process. process. So the, the suggestion is maybe we change well, when maybe we make the uh, ISO approval process to say we have core fixes and then we have library fixes and they are independent from each other. I'm not sure that this is a good thing because it, there is some relations between core language features and the library. <laughs> okay, I don't have a solution. I just want to make people aware of the problem we have. Something will happen. Sometimes you learn it the hard way. So, my message here for this group is it's key to have guidelines for how to use C++ core features or significant C++ core features. Ideally, before we have to adopt them in the library. which is way before Scott or Herb write books or blogs about that. Michael. So, I think, I think the problem goes further than just lack of attention at the uh, design level. Sometimes these guidelines cannot emerge until you have seen the whole thing. Many of the problems we've observed is a <coughs> interaction, say, with new semantics with no exams. When we put that in context, we add that with another one, with auto, with templatized um, default arguments. Now, some of those might not even have been invented. Yeah, you say it's, it's, it's hard to, because some of these features interact with each other. And um, I, I, would, I would think, but by the way, this is, this is not, nothing new. We had that in C++ 19.8 already. 
If we would have known the consequences of namespace, we wouldn't have that feature in that way in C++ 98. So one, one or at least ADL, yes? Hmm? Just to follow on, one possible suggestion is, it's great to wait for the book, um, but maybe one possible suggestion is that the, the standard has this TR process still, different than the TS process, <coughs> which I, maybe you'll explain. Um, and I can invite if people want to know. And maybe we need it. Um, maybe maybe the standard should spend some time gathering people together to build a TR on the guidelines after the emergence of a new standard and given sufficient time and experience. So you said that maybe we use a TR, which is a technical report, in, in, as an extension to TS, technical specification, to, to make a two-step approach here. Yeah, I don't care about the details here. And, and I, I just want to, maybe I should say something. This problem, to some extent, is natural. So um, the least thing I want to I wanna make sure is that you know about this problem. And the other thing is that we care a lot more for having early guidelines, so that we are interested in guidelines especially when we add new core features. It seems that we have a lack of, of um, well, a lack of a view in the standardization group how to use features. We are keen on new features, but we have a lack of reflecting on what is the effect, what could be the effect, what is the outcome. So, it's okay for me to have some initial guidelines for a new feature and then find out later, as we have learned with the, with the no accept uh, policy. And uh, yeah, but, but we, we, we should have something like that. So in, in a company, I would say, there has to be a quality gate for that before we adopt a new feature that we have some initial guidelines. <coughs> So you say the problem is that LWG and EWG guys don't talk with each other, whether it's the evolution working group and the library evolution working group. Um, well, yes and no. Uh, they talk to each other. And um, by the way, it's not, it's not exactly that. It's, um, I have to go back to one slide. Hello, there. Well, in general, we talk. And in general, people go around in the meetings and go in, uh, into different rooms and all. And what I, what I, what I, and discussing here is that we have in core a new feature, an evolution. This has to be discussed not with the evolution library group, but with the core, the, with, the, with the library maintenance group. And guess what? The library maintenance group is the, less, the least coolest group in this standardization group. <laughs> we have sometimes problems to find enough people to get a quote, a quorum which means we need something like six people. So, and, 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 and we know all each other. So Marshall is there, uh, Stefan, so, so, uh, Jonathan Sobob from the compiler vendor is one guy. I am there, and um, Alistair Marisdith, and, and two or three others. That's it. Because the cool f and fun stuff is done in the other groups. New features, great. But how to d apply this feature, that, that's part of this group, and this group, has a tremendous problem now because again and again there are new proposals and we all have to review them uh, and, and, and we only review it. So does this fit into the general schema of how the library is designed? Uh, we have no t time to discuss the, any guidelines that follow from that other than what I said, what happens is that we find out that we are going into a mess. We avoided that mess with no except. We 
have a little bit of a mess with uh, explicit, which we will clean up now. And we have a complete mess with const exp. I'm fascinated by our process. In a company, we expect, sign, implement, we test, <coughs> we document, and then we release. It's a standard, specified, document, release. So then we start implementing and testing, right? No, that's not the, the question. Is don't is, is is there one problem that we but that we do t testing after we re we release in the standardization? That's that's not strictly true. I mean, we, we release, um, but but we re release locally for this feature, so we don't have the common view about everything. So is this library feature implemented? That's a common question. Yes, it is, and. There are also some, some core experiences. So you have something in mind with const expert, yeah, I can check that min and max now with const expert have that and that effect. But as Michael pointed out, the, the, we don't have something like an overall test suite in an abstraction layer of how deal with features with each, each other. We have a lot of test suites, is broken or not. But what does this core feature mean in general for how to use C++ in libraries and for the application programmer? That's, that's a problem, yeah. Okay. Okay. We really start that and then the compiler is implementing. So, maybe it would be better to make this is what we want to do, then we get to implement the compiler, then the experts of the library teams test it and try and see what it works, and then the contribution started after. So we have to be what's going after, but at least it's tested. So you, your proposing shouldn't be when we develop a new core feature, then um, implement it, then find the effects, and, the, and after that we standardize it and we put it into an official standard. I mean, no doubt that's a better approach. The question is whether it's practical. Marshall. Yeah. Yeah, I just, <coughs> is this on? Yeah. I, I just wanted to remind everybody that the, the output, the result of the standards committee is a specification. It's not a, it's not a compiler, it's not a standard library implementation, it's a specification. And then people go off and they implement this specification. Um, and so there's, there's a fundamental disconnect there with the idea of testing stuff. The, a lot of the library implementers and the, the compiler implementers will be out in front of the, uh, the current state of the official spec, you know, testing proposals, you know, implementing proposals and gaining implementation experience. But um, they all have other things to do as well. So, if I understand you correctly, what you strongly recommend is to implement first. Because one additional problem is once you have implemented it and standardized it, it's it's a it's a lot more difficult to change it. No. No. If, if we do that and the feature is changed later in the standard, and since the old version of the feature is already, <coughs> it's going to be a big pressure from the compiler side onto the standard. Oh, so oh, you, you say the good thing with the, the not implementing it is that it does not happen that you implement it, then make experience, and then have to change the implementation, which breaks something. This is interesting. We have the same problem, by the way, with library features. So from time to time, the question comes up. Um, um, for example, it, it was close to the end of C++ 11. I found out some, some design flaws uh, with um, place, I think. And um, it was a clear bad design. And um, 
The point was, some implementers had already shipped this in place function as part of their product. So the reason that it was not fixed for C++11 was simply because the implementation of this library feature was already spread out to the world. So, yeah, so I see your point, yeah. Just going back to, to your guidelines, I think it's important that they not only cover using the language in the standard library, but also for, you know, everyday application here. Yeah, so the question is, should, shouldn't this, these guidelines be only for library design and, uh, but also for other? Is that they should, they should also cover? Yeah, they should also cover application programs. It's, I, I cover that question exactly in the next slide. So, uh, China. I wanted to point out that I don't know of any implementations which didn't implement and ship some C++ 11 features before C++ 11. <coughs> so if you're concerned about implementers, you know, starting off with features before they're standardized and they standardize something slightly different, implementers have to ship them. Um, all the implementers had to do this already. It's not the end of the world. It's not scary. I, I, I don't think that there's like, that's not true. already implementing standards before they are shipping. And we have been around. Like, Tony? It, we really have to mention TSs and the fact that if we're changing the process of how we do the standardization. We're really leaning more towards TSs now so that everything that does go into this, not everything, but a lot of things going into the standard, our first a TS, we write an implementation, we put it out there for the world, and basically the world tests it for us. And then we go, oh, that was a bad design, let's change it, or that was great, let's standardize it. So, so, okay. so Tony's comment is that that's exactly the one reason we have TSs, so technical specifications, so that these technical specifications um, implement something and provide something as a pre-standard so that we can st still change to, before we approve it into something like C++17 or C++20. So that, that's a point we raised there, okay. Yeah, kind of following on the last two comments, like, a lot of people are talking about this as though it were theoretical, like it would be nice if we got experience before we actually. Like I've been using C plus plus fourteen in Plan 34 and GCC 49 for a few months now. And I know a lot of other people have here as well. So like we do have experience with the standard before it's coming. So you say we have experience before it's out because we are in the in the in the good situation that especially for C plus plus fourteen uh, well, almost all features were available for, for a broader audience and community. Yep. But, but still we have, yeah, we, we still have some questions. I mean, all features are there to discuss, shouldn't make pair be declared differently? Huh? So, yeah, so why, why don't we know the answer to that? <laughs> I know why. Okay. To wrap up. We need guidelines. I mean, that's, that's obvious. I, I, I don't claim about it. I know we are doing the best we can, just to make that clear. It's, 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 a, it's a process, but it's important if you have a process from time to time to, um, to have a retrospective and think about shouldn't we change the process. And we have discussions about changing the process. Um, but I think this is, these are concrete needs I have now, um, especially for writing my books. <laughs> but which means to explain it to you, as others have. Gabi. Um, as a community, I think we are too risk averse, thinking that if we don't take the chances, then we might be imperfect. I don't believe that. Um, look at this CW, they're not releasing if I understand you correctly, you say that if we would have changed the process, so to to review and try out and things, we would still not be perfect. Yes, yes. and I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a living thing. It's all my point is we have a need now for something, and. I don't even know where to raise this need. I, I will probably, for the next meeting in Rappersville, my plan is, it's one week left, 
to have a new version or to fix no accept guidelines and to provide a first draft to fix explicit because I understand I understood that topics good enough to at least suggest the obvious things that should be fixed. Um, but for the other stuff, I'm looking for volunteers. Yeah. Just to kind of in some historical perspective, is do we have the same problem with exceptions and hand giving safe exceptions when the earlier version of the standard came out? It took a couple of years to realize that. Did we have the same problems with exceptions, or did we have the same problems in the past? Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why we have no accept now. <laughs> It's not only because of move semantics. It's also because uh, except, uh, exception was broken. Ex 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 um, actually, I remember the last meeting before we f uh, finalized C++ 198. We had a big, 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 but we had two big discussions. One was autopoint. <laughs> and the other was... Um, could exceptions, uh, can uh, do exception or does the exception handling uh, spe specifications we have, do they cause runtime penalties in the case when we don't throw an exception? So is there a penalty we pay? And the assumption was that we are able to implement this technique so that there is no runtime overhead in the good case which turned out to be wrong. And um, same, by the way, for AutoPointer. Uh, can we deal with move semantics in AutoPointer? There was an interesting paper, Beeman, you will remember. Uh, that was really the last decision, I think, we, to, to say that So I think some, some compiler guys created some rules where, yes, this should work, this could work. And it turned out it didn't work. Yes, so we have made this mistake already, as I mentioned namespace already. Yeah, it's, it's not a new problem. And we still can live with it. So I don't, I don't, I'm not asking for perfectionism. Yeah, we, we still have a good standard. We, we are still making a lot of prog progress. I, I just want to move the focus a little bit on something where I think we need more focus on. So you've raised, so for, for who are the guys who need these guidelines? And yeah, in fact, the discussion is, don't we need different guidelines? So one thing is for library implementers or for the standard library implementers. And by the way, I mentioned it the day before yesterday, we have the interesting effect that we have two kinds of libraries now. We have the foundation libraries and the libraries on top of them. Foundation libraries to bring more or less the core data type, something that you might consider as fundamental data type in a broader sense. So like vector, string, um, maybe thread or something like that. So and, and then on, on, on top we might have new implementers, maybe not in the standard yet, but this is changing I think, and, but especially outside the standard for people who write libraries or frameworks and using these foundation classes. And then we have those programmers who implement classes and utilities just because it's for their business application. And then we have the ordinary application programmer. Maybe the upper two groups are the same, I don't know. So the, the interesting question is here, and that's correct, do we have the same guidelines or different guidelines for these different groups? And the other question is, which group has to know and understand which detail? So what I presented here as problem and features and discussions we had, um, do I have to present these discussions in a tutorial for ordinary C++ programmers or not? Or is it just for, to, for an advanced tutorial for those who really want to understand the details? And that's, that's the reason why this talk is called Beware of C++. I think if I'm going to be asked which, which problems mentioned in this talk should know or be aware of, 
the ordinary C++ programmer? The answer is <coughs> too much. So there, we still have an issue to, to make things better and to hide the lower layers with some abstractions on the other. But we, we have improvements, no doubt about that. Thank you very much.